Happy Thursday. I have been so blessed by the week of prayer. It's been, it's been amazing. The Lord has been speaking to us in so many different ways. And um, a verse that comes to my mind in 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 8, the Bible says, but the end of all things is at hand. Be ye therefore sober and watch unto prayer. And with everything that we've heard from the week of prayer so far, there's a watching that does have to take place because family, we're so used to hearing sermons. We're so used to coming to church. We're used at Watchita Hills. We hear people speak all the time. And it's so easy for the devil to come and pick up those seeds that we've been hearing all day long. And usually what takes place is we hear it in the morning and then he has a plan to take it away from us throughout the day. So, you know, as I was thinking about what to share with you guys, and I was thinking, Lord, we've heard so many of these things so many times. And the Lord put upon my seven bullshit, they need to hear it over and over and over again. And I need to hear it over and over and over again. So as you guys are sitting and listening, allow the Lord to speak to you. Um, the purpose of the Bible is to transform. And Jesus is a surgeon, amen? amen. But you want to know something interesting about surgery? It's to heal, and it hurts sometimes when you come out of surgery. So if something inside of the Word of God hurts, don't be afraid. It has to come out. But Jesus is going to do something so powerful in the healing that he's going to do right after that. Amen? Well, family, as we've been hearing these messages for a very long time, um, we've been 1844 to 2020. What's that, 176 years? It's been 176 years, and Noah was preaching for 120 years. And you know what took place after Noah was preaching for 120 years? How many people entered the ship? Eight people entered the ship. And you know what's interesting? The Bible says, as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the time of the coming of the Son of Man. In other words, we ourselves are going to need something miraculous to enter the ship that God has for us, which is Jesus Christ. And it's going to take a miracle. The title of my message is, It Took a Miracle, and He's Willing to Do One in Your Life Today. Amen. But let's go ahead and have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you so much for prayer. And I thank you so much, Lord, for the privilege to share what it is that you've been giving me. And Lord, I'm just asking that you'll help the people not to see me, but to see your son. And Father, just help their ears to be open to hear your Holy Spirit speaking. Lord, help my ears to be open to hear your Spirit speaking, that I may know what to share, what not to share. And I just thank you so much for your love and what you're getting ready to do in our hearts. And we ask this in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I like miracles. I often have prayed for God to show me different types of miracles. And the Lord has rarely answer the prayer, at least according to what I want, because he shows us miracles every single day, all day long. Usually we're just not open to hearing them. And I want to share one with you that I actually got to experience. Mark Kendi was there when we experienced this miracle. It was a tremendous event. And we were at church, and a good brother of ours came to church, and he brought a friend. And this friend was deaf. He actually invited his mom. He met, he met the mom of the friend, and the mom brought him to church, and she let the brother know, you know, my, my son is deaf, and he can't hear. So he came to church. Um, he was probably maybe in his late 20s or early 30s. He had dreads, a bigger guy, just to give you a picture of what he looked like. Really nice guy, um, he seemed like. But um, so anyways, we had like an anointing service, and they brought him to the front of the church, and they said, we're going to pray for him. And... I was actually on the pulpit that Sabbath, so I was wondering, like, Lord, I've never, like, prayed for someone, and it's like, Lord, what is going to happen? All these thoughts are coming to my mind, but um, 
And they asked my brother, who invited them to church, to come and pray instead. And they did the anointing service. And in the middle of the prayer, all of a sudden, the guy says, I can hear you. I can hear you. And everyone stopped, and it just got quiet. And my heart started beating, and I was like, Lord. And it was so amazing. And he could hear, like, after, after when we were having potluck, he could still hear. And it was just like, it was so strange, because we had never seen something like that before. And the unique thing about Elisha is his life is full of miracles. And I want to share with you one of the greatest miracles that Jesus can do inside of your life. Turn with me to 2 Kings chapter 6. 2 Kings chapter 6. Did everyone bring a Bible? Amen. That's okay. There's time for repentance. 2 (laughs) Kings chapter 6. Turn to 2 Kings chapter 6, and we're going to start at verse 1. When you get there, say amen. Amen. 2 Kings chapter 6, verse 1, it says, And the sons of the prophets said unto Elisha, Behold now, the place where we dwell with thee is too straight for us, or it's too small. Let us go, we pray thee, unto where? Jordan. What river? The Jordan River. And take thence every man a beam, and let us make us a place there where we may dwell. And he answered, Go ye. And one said, Be content, I pray thee. In other words, please, be okay with this. And go with thy servants. And he answered, I will go. You know, it's interesting, family. This reminds me of when Jesus was walking. What actually, two of Jesus' disciples, people who had been with him and who had heard him while he was speaking, after Jesus had died, they were walking and they were moping around and they were discouraged about what had taken place and how Jesus had died. And then all of a sudden, a friend comes along the way and he starts expounding the scriptures to them. And their hearts did what within them? They burned within them. But all of a sudden... Jesus, who they didn't know it was Jesus, he was getting ready to leave. And what took place as he was getting ready to leave? They said, come. In other words, they were eager to stay in his presence because they knew something was actually taking place. And the same here, family, as Elijah was with them, they knew the power and the influence of Elisha. But they begged for Elijah to stay with them and to say, come. We want to do this, but we want you to be here. And praise God that they asked him to do that because he showed them something so powerful later on. Let's keep reading. What verse are we at? Verse 3. Actually, verse 4. And it says, So he went with them, and when they came to Jordan, they cut down what? Wood. But as one was felling a beam, the axe head fell into the water. And he cried and said, Alas, master, for it was borrowed. And the man of God said, Where fell it, or where did it fall? And he showed him the place, and he cut down a stick and cast it in thither. And the iron did what? Swim. Verse 7. Therefore said he, take it up to thee. And he put out his hand and took it. Now this is interesting because for one, we see something very obvious. God cares about the little things. The fact that Elisha did a miracle for an axe head that fell inside of the water, that seems so minute. It seems like something that could have just been replaced anyhow. But the Lord cares. He cares about the simple things inside of our lives. And family, when something takes place inside of your life, if you lose a shoe, if you lose your laptop, if you lose your homework, or whatever it may be, don't be afraid to go to God and ask him for help. He longs to show you his power for the simple things, but he shows you his power for the simple things that he may teach you a greater lesson. What was he trying to show them here? The axe head was doing what when it hit the water? It sunk. Now, for the physics people, what causes something to sink inside of water? The law of what? Density. Now, the interesting thing about density is, basically, when something is more, if the axe head is more dense than the water, it's going to sink. In other words, I don't really know the formula too well. I think it's like mass and volume. But in other words, the axe head was more dense than the water, so therefore it sunk. By law, the axe head deserved to sink. There was nothing that could be done for the axe head to float. Otherwise, it would defy the laws of nature. Family, it's very interesting because a lot of us are sinking in the pool of sin. A lot of us are drowning inside of our sins yearning for help and asking Jesus to do something inside of our lives. And you know what's very interesting is, especially at a place like here at Wachita Hills, 
A lot of us may be drowning inside of our sins, but no one may know. And the sad part about it is, if you go to Isaiah chapter 49, and verse 24, you don't have to turn there, but it says, Shall the prey be taken from the mighty, or the lawful captive delivered? In other words, by law, because of the presumptuous sins that we commit, because of our lack of watching and praying, lawfully we have a right to be in Satan's hands. Lawfully we give Satan advantage inside of our lives, and we're drowning. And it's like, Lord, I don't know what to do. And sometimes it can discourage us. And it's like, Lord, I know I committed that sin. I know I shouldn't have done that sin. And now I'm suffering all the consequences of sin. And the enemy came in like a flood. But because of negligence, the Spirit of God wasn't able to lift up a standard on our behalf. But let's keep on reading. It's said that after it sunk, Elijah did something. And verse 6, and he showed him the place and cut down a what? cut down a stick and threw it into the water. Family, turn with me. Keep your finger there. Turn with me to Isaiah chapter 11. Isaiah chapter 11. Let's say that he cut down a stick or he cut down a branch. He cut down a stick or he cut down a branch. We're going to start at Isaiah chapter 11 and verse 1. When you get there, say amen. amen. Listen to the Holy Spirit, friends. He's trying to share something very powerful with you at this moment. Is everyone there? It says, and there shall come forth a what? A rod out of the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. And the spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord. Who is this speaking about? Jesus. Family, when we're drowning in the pool of sin, Even though it's our fault that we fell into that sin, God cut down his son, sent him into the earth for us just so that we could have the privilege to float above sin. And family, when you think about this, it's like, what? It doesn't make sense. A quote comes to my mind in Desire of Ages, page 131, paragraph 1. She says, never can the cost of redemption be realized until the redeemed shall stand with the Redeemer before the throne of God. And then she says, Then as the glories of the eternal home burst upon our enraptured senses, we shall remember that Christ left all this for us, that he not only became an exile from the heavenly courts, but for us took the risk of failure and eternal loss. Do you guys know what an exile is? Someone who's been kicked out. Jesus was thrown into the pool of sin unaffected by sin, didn't commit a sin himself, but he came to suffer your punishment just so that you could have the privilege to flow. And family, we have to think about these things because you know what's very interesting? Adriana said something so powerful this morning. She says, all it takes is a choice. We have to make the choice to stop committing sin. But you want to know something that's real? It's hard for us to choose to do right. But you want to know what makes the choice a lot easier? Is if we keep our minds on this. If we constantly keep in our mind that Jesus died for my sins, I no longer want to hurt him. I don't want to do that to my Savior because he took the risk of failure and eternal loss for me, the God of the universe. And family, do you guys know how big the universe is? I don't know either. But I know some (laughs) small things. (laughs) I'll give you an idea. The sun, I was, I was just different statistics, the sun is 93 million miles away from the earth. And it's so powerful that it's able to warm up this earth, so much so that we walk outside and we sweat and we're hot. But the light from the sun is actually eight minutes old. So the light that we're receiving is actually old light. But it's also interesting, they were talking about the size of the earth. I was looking on NASA.gov, and they said if you wanted to compare the earth to the size of the sun, it would be equivalent to taking a quarter and putting it in front of an average-sized door. The earth would be the quarter, and the sun would be the door. And you think about the person who spoke that into existence, made the decision to say, I'm going to humble myself, throw myself into the pool of water for your sin, just so that you can have the opportunity to be saved. Not the guarantee, the opportunity to be saved. A lot of us wouldn't do something like that even if the person was 100% that they're going to accept it. 
But Jesus made that decision knowing that a majority of people are going to reject it. A majority. And family, when I think about that, it makes choosing righteousness a lot easier. Amen? But you know, that's the justification experience. We have to see it, but we also have to believe it. You know, the man had to reach out and grab it after the miracle took place. And it's a miracle. It took a miracle for that to take place. And it takes a miracle for the Son of God to become a man. It's unexplainable, the incarnation of Christ. But family, we have to receive it and believe it. We have to hold on to it by faith, even if you don't feel it. Even if it doesn't feel like Jesus did that for you. Believe it. Why? Because his word said so. And family, that's so important for the next miracle that, was take place, that took place. Go with me to 2 Kings chapter 13. 2 Kings chapter 13. And when you get there, say amen. amen. While some of you are still turning, there's a quote here in Mind, Character, Personality, Volume 2, page 540, paragraph 1. It says, when we lay hold of Christ by faith, our work has just begun. So now that you've received Jesus by faith, now that he's pulled you out of the water of sin, your work has just what? Begun. And this is really important to understand, family, because a lot of people just stop here. But Jesus wants us to keep going. It says, every man has corrupt and sinful habits that must be overcome by vigorous warfare. What type of warfare? Vigorous warfare. It says, every soul is required to fight the fight of faith. And we're going to look at a man who was required to do that. 2 Kings chapter 13, are you guys there? And we're going to start at verse 14. It says, Now Elisha was fallen sick of his sickness, whereof he died. And Joash the king of Israel came down unto him and wept over his face, and said, O oh, my father, my father, the chariot of Israel and the horsemen thereof. And Elisha said unto him, Take bow and arrows, and he took unto him bow and arrows, and he said to the king of Israel, Put thine hand upon the bow. And he put his hand upon it, and Elisha put his hands upon the king's hands, and he said, Open the window eastward. Let's say this is eastward. And he opened it. Then Elisha said, Shoot, and he shot. And then it says, The arrow of the Lord's deliverance. The arrow of deliverance from where? Syria. For thou shalt smite the Syrians in Aphek, till thou have consumed them. Now, this is very interesting. Joash was very discouraged. Why do you guys think Joash was discouraged when Elisha was getting ready to die? Who was Elisha? Elisha was a prophet. He was a prophet, but he was a very, very influential prophet. So many things took place to the children of Israel because of Elisha. And it felt like, you know, the only hope, the only power that we have is getting ready to die. And you know what's really interesting, friends? Prophets and kings in the Bible as well lets us know that Joash was a wicked young man. He was actually a youth. So we're able to relate with him. He was a wicked young man. And you can imagine that this man is getting ready to die. And he knew that the power that Elisha had came from the Lord. And I'm pretty sure Joash knew that he was not serving God with all his heart. And sometimes we can find ourselves in the same situation. When we're getting ready to go into a battle with the enemy, with self, it seems that when temptation comes, it feels like, Lord, I'm not worthy to go up against this temptation. I've fallen into the sin over and over and over again. And it's like, Lord, I know you forgave me that one time, but you forgave me so many other times as well. It's like, Lord, I need help. But you know what's interesting? Even though Joash was not worthy of any type of power, because of the merits and the righteousness of Christ, because of the Holy Spirit upon Elisha, he was able to receive the benefit. Amen? Amen? Family, it's not because of your righteousness that Christ is able to help you. It's because of his righteousness. So when the enemy comes to you and he starts telling you things like you're not able to fight that fight. Yeah, you had your sins forgiven, but look, you're going to fall into that sin again. Tell the enemy that there is hope in Christ Jesus. And those are the things that we have to claim. Going on, it says here, Actually, just to read this quote to you, on Prophets and Kings, page 261, paragraph 2, to many a troubled soul in need of help, the prophet Elisha had acted the part of a wise, sympathetic father. And in this instance, he turned not from the godless use before him. So unworthy of the position of trust he was occupying, and yet so in need of counsel. So going on, if we look at verse 18, it says here, 
And he said, take the arrows. And what did he do? He took them. And he said unto the king of Israel, smite upon the ground. And he smote how many times? And stayed. Now this is interesting. Actually, let's read verse 19 as well. It says, and the man of God was happy. No, he was wroth. The man of God was wroth or was angry with him and said, Thou should have smitten five or six times. Then hadst thou smitten Syria till thou hast consumed it, whereas now thou shalt smite Syria but thrice. You know, it's interesting. What did Elisha tell Joash when he shot the arrow eastward? What did he say? He says, this is an arrow of what? Deliverance. In other words, he had given him a promise. Family, the Bible is full of promises. So many promises. But you know what's interesting? When temptations and trials come, and we're faced with another trial, and we're faced with an opportunity to gain the victory, we claim the promise once, maybe once, maybe twice, and we don't hold on to that promise. We don't keep on holding on to the power of God, and as a result, we're overcome. As a result, God is not able to defeat the enemy completely in our lives, and the seeds of rebellion stay inside of our hearts, or the demons don't flee completely, and it's because of our lack of faith. Family, there has to be a cooperation with God. Now that you've given yourself to Jesus and you've seen the power of his word, you've seen that he has power to forgive sins, that same power that is in Christ to forgive sins is the same power that is there to give you victory over every single sin. How many sins? Every single sin. Family, that's truth. And the Bible says you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. But family, I know it's hard. The enemy comes in like a flood and he bombards our minds with lies. He's a father of all lies. You want to know what's interesting about a lie? Or what's good about a lie? It's not true. <laughs> imagine, this is what the devil does. I tell this illustration to some friends of mine a lot. And imagine that, so my name is Moboshe. This is what Satan does. He'll come to you and he'll say, hey, Jacob. He's whispering in my ear. He's like, hi, Jacob. How's your day, Jacob? I'm like, my name is not Jacob. It's like, I have my ID, I have my driver's license, I have my passport, I have my social security card. I have all the evidence to let him know that my name is Moboshe. But the devil will come and tell you, you're going to struggle with this sin for your whole life. You saw how, you over, how you're overcoming this sin? You saw how you're overcoming that area? You saw how that person's not gaining victory? You see how that person's not gaining victory? You see how the Bible's not true in this area? He'll tell you all these lies. And you know, it's so interesting because Jesus said, the truth shall make you free. And in John 17, 17, he said, sanctify them by thy truth. Thy word is truth. When we believe the promises of God, Satan has no more dominion over us. One of my favorite quotes before I quote it, I'm going to share a Bible verse that shares the same principle. In 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 4, turn to 2 Peter 1, verse 4. We want to see how the Bible says something and then use the spirit of prophecy to back it up after. When you get there, say amen. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 4. It says, whereby are given unto them what? Exceeding great. And what type of promises? Precious promises that by what? By these you might become partakers of what nature? The divine nature, having done what? Escape the corruption that is in the world through lust. That is a promise. Desire of Ages, page 123, paragraph 4. Very easy quote to remember. 1, 2, 3, 4. It says, Every promise in the word of God is ours. By every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God, we are to live by. It says, When assailed by temptation... Look not to circumstance or to the weakness of self. Look not to what? Circumstance or to the weakness of self, but to the power of God's word. Family, when Satan comes in like a flood, guys, it doesn't matter how much the flesh is yearning to indulge in your mind. Sisters, it doesn't matter how much your imagination is yearning to emotionally lust after that guy. It doesn't matter what the flesh says. The Holy Spirit is giving you power to subdue the flesh. 
My Character Personality, Volume 2, page 516 says, The Christian will feel the promptings of sin. For the flesh lusteth against the spirit, and the spirit striveth against the flesh, keeping up a constant warfare. And then it says, Here is where Christ's help is needed. Divine strength becomes united with human weakness, and faith exclaims, Thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through Christ Jesus our Lord. So when the flesh is lusting against the spirit and it feels like you have no power to overcome, that's when you claim the promise of God and by faith, not by feeling, by faith you say, Lord, Jesus gained a victory and his victory has been given to me because of his righteousness. And I claim that. And family, I can tell you by experience, every single time you do this and you take up your bed and you walk in it, the result comes immediately the enemy flees away. Do you guys remember what took place in the wilderness when Jesus was being tempted? He said, it is written, it is written, it is written. He didn't smite the ground only three times. He, he hit the ground as many times as it took for divine power to be used on his behalf. And eventually, if you guys read Desire of Ages, it says divinity rose and flashed through humanity. And then it says the devil ran away in terror. And family, when the Holy Spirit is with you, the Holy Spirit will then lift up a standard for you, and that same flood that you were sinking in before, you never have to drown in again. And family, that's what God wants to do inside of your lives. We have one more story. In verse number 20, it says this, and Elisha what? Died. Or if you go back to 2 Kings chapter 13, we're looking at verse number 20. Are you guys there? Amen. It says, and Elisha died, and they buried him. And the bands of the Moabites invaded the land at the coming in of the year. And it came to pass as they were burying a man that, behold, they spied a band of men, and they cast the man into the sepulcher of Elisha. And when the man was let down and touched the bones of Elisha, he revived and stood up on his feet. Family, that man only received life because he was dead. Think about that for a second. The only reason he received life was because he was dead. Now, it's interesting. There's good news. Well, everyone in this room is dead in one way or another. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1, it says, And you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins. You could be dead in sin or our lovely scripture song, Colossians 3, verse 3. For ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. Family, by God's grace, if you by faith are in that category where Jesus has quickened you, and you're no longer dead in trespasses and sins, and your life is hid in Christ with God, stay in contact with the death of Christ. Keep your eyes focused on the cross, because there's power in the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Elisha had so much of the Holy Spirit that even his bones were able to give people power when they came in contact with it. And the same thing with us. The cross is full of so much power that if you keep your mind focused on the principles of Calvary, if you spend a thoughtful hour every single day, not just in the morning, because we quote that and we read it and it's like, Lord, I'm spending a thoughtful hour and I'm still not being transformed. What does that mean practically? Guys, when you eat food inside of the morning, in the morning, how long does it take to digest? Four to five hours. Spirit of prophecy says five to six hours. It takes time for it to assimilate and actually take place and produce, basically benefit the body. The same thing with our devotions in the morning. When you study the life of Christ in the morning, meditate on his life all day long, as much as possible. You will not be crazy. When you go to the table, think about Jesus. And as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. And out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. So if you're thinking about Jesus all day long, you're constantly going to be thinking of new ways you can talk about Jesus all day long. And family, that's how you stay in connection with the cross. That's how you carry your cross with you everywhere. Well, actually, you're beholding the cross, and that gives you power to then carry your cross and deny self. And family, it's only when you stay in connection and contact with the cross that you actually have power. Otherwise, it's going to be a constant life of defeat. Or you're going to be trying to gain victory, but it's going to be in your own works and your own strength. 
and it's not going to be by faith. The other group of people who may be dead and sitting inside of this room, and you know that your spiritual life is dead, and there's no power inside of your life, and you're longing, you're saying, Lord, I need help. I need power. The Bible says, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation. Family, for you, if that's you, if you come in contact with the cross of Calvary, you will be revived. I can guarantee it. It is the law of the gospel. If you come in connection with the cross and you just stay there, stay at the feet of Jesus, just like Mary Magdalene, you will be revived. Family, Jesus wants to do this inside of our hearts. I grew up in the Seventh-day Adventist church, and I did not like church at all because I didn't see any benefit. But you want to know what's interesting? The reason why young people don't like church is because they don't see power inside of it. If it was the people in the days of the apostles, the young people of that day, when they saw their mom and dad, you know, raising people from the dead, and this shadow was walking by, and you walked in someone's shadow, and someone was healed, that's power. And young people are striving for power. But the reason why we don't have power in our lives is because we're not staying in connection with the power source. We keep walking away. And family, that does not have to take place every single day. Jesus has been waiting for a very long time to come home, but his children are just not getting it. So I want to make an appeal, three appeals. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed. If you realize that you have been dead, and I want you to really pray and examine your hearts, you realize that you have been dead and you want the Lord to revive you, you're saying, Lord, give me that spiritual life. I've had a dead spiritual walk. I want you to raise your hand so that I can lift you up in prayer. Amen. Second appeal. You realize that you haven't been claiming God's promises. And like Joash, you let go of the promises so soon. And you, com and you want to commit to intentionally spending time in the word of God. And this is for anyone. If you realize that you haven't been spending time with Jesus and you want to make a plan and say, Lord, I want to spend more time with you, I want you to come forward to the front so that we can pray and pray that the Holy Spirit will give you power to do that. Family, every single one of you who are choosing to come forward, understand that the angels are writing this down. And they're looking at this and they're saying, you have made a choice that you now want to decide to spend time with Jesus, to keep his word inside of your heart, that you no longer want to waste time, that you actually want to make that choice to keep the power with you, to keep God's power with you. And keep that commitment, friends. Keep that commitment. Let's go ahead and have a word of prayer. Kneel with me if you're able to. Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you so much for your love, and I thank you so much for your patience. Lord, you have been so patient with me. Words cannot even describe how patient you have been with me. And I'm so thankful that I'm here today, Lord, to still be able to talk about you, to experience your love, and to share that love with my friends. And Lord, I'm just pleading that me, with all of my friends here in this room, that you will help us Please give us the strength that we need to overcome self. Lord, we cannot overcome in our own strength. It's too strong. But Father, we can do all things through Christ, and that strengthens us. He is our strength. God is our refuge, and God is our strength. And we claim that promise, Father. We hold on to that promise that you will strengthen us. You will uphold us with the right hand of your righteousness. That same word, Lord. We're holding on to it, Lord, and I'm just asking that you'll be with my friends here who have made a decision to set time aside, to actually go through the word of God, to keep promises in their hearts that they may have power, that they may not strike the ground only three times, but five, six, or seven times, showing that they believe in your promises. And Father, for those who are struggling in their spiritual life and who may be dead in trespasses and sins, I'm asking that you'll show them, Lord Christ. Help them to see the one who has power that they may too go forward and share the same message that you have been showing to their heart. I thank you for hearing this prayer, and I ask this in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.